If the sun decided to stop producing light, then the animals in the wild would be the first to notice. Most animals need daytime to roam from place to place, especially in the large savannas in Africa. Zebras, wildebeests, and giraffes all need the day to move to avoid predators. As soon as the sun goes down, it's their bedtime. If the sun suddenly went dark, animals wouldn't comprehend what was going on and would simply become an early lunch for predators. Nocturnal creatures would be equally confused at the time change. Birds usually flock during the day, so we wouldn't hear or see any of them. We have them to thank for eating pests in the sky. Well, them and bats. But if you're in an area with no bats, then consider the insects to be the winners here. Temperatures would start to drop gradually. Humans would notice the effects as well. We're used to having the sun shining at the peak of noon. But with the sunshine's disappearance, we would be living in total darkness. It'd just be a matter of survival. If the sun suddenly got dark, then we'd only have around eight minutes to enjoy the rest of it. That's because it takes that much time for sunlight to travel thousands of miles across the solar system. We would have to use UV lights to grow some crops, but it wouldn't be enough to feed the whole world, not to mention the dropping temperatures across the world. Survival would be difficult in the open plain. Everyone would have to duck inside shelters and warm bunkers. Plants need photosynthesis to grow. Without it, we wouldn't have any crops. Bread wouldn't exist since it needs wheat. Even the algae in the oceans need photosynthesis to survive, which is the highest source of oxygen rather than forests. This means oxygen levels would start to deplete. Large bodies of water like lakes, oceans, and seas would also start to lack oxygen to sustain marine life. One of our main sources of vitamin D is the sun. There are other ways of getting it, but the sun is the best and most convenient way. Without crops or vegetation, all the herbivores would have to rummage for the last green grass on land or a leaf hanging from a tree. They would soon run out of food, which would also be bad news for us humans, since we need animals like cows, horses, and sheep for our livelihoods. This wouldn't happen overnight. Of course, the oceans would remain warm for some time, but eventually, they would get cold and freeze. Earth is still a planet powered by an iron core that produces so much heat. This would not be enough to keep the planet warm. Our next step would be finding the right shelter and keeping warm. If this happened overnight, then chances are there wouldn't be any ready-made bunkers for a scenario like this. Unless you're watching this video and decide to build one after. They would have to provide heat 24-7 and be capable of growing crops under UV light. Solar-powered facilities would be a thing of the past. People would have to wear sustainable suits when venturing out into the open. Since it would be so dark, we would need strong lights or powerful night vision goggles to see anything. The lands would be desolate. Nocturnal creatures that can handle freezing temperatures would take it over. Structures would collapse since there would be oxygen depletion. Concrete needs oxygen to remain intact. The bunkers themselves would have limited oxygen as well. We would need to uproot many trees and place them under strong UV lights for them to produce oxygen. In turn, it would produce its ecosystem in the large underground bunkers. The oceans on the surface would freeze over eventually. Gathering any natural resources from the ocean floor, like gas or oil, would be impossible. The large object, which used to be a bright and sunny star, would still be floating around. But what would happen if the sun disappeared overnight? Well, pretty much the same thing, except way worse. The sun is the largest celestial object in our solar system, which keeps all of our planets lined up the way they are. They orbit around the sun, minding their own business. Without such a large object keeping them steady, the planets would start to float around randomly. Some might even collide with each other. In other cases, the planets would just float around and fly off into space eventually, until they found a new star to orbit around. Earth might or might not be one of those planets. Our planet would still be dark. We would be flying through space at an unusual speed. The planet wouldn't rotate on itself, and many objects would crash into us. We'd be in the trajectory line of mass comets waiting to strike us down. 
The threat of the cold wouldn't be a major factor anymore. It would be what's beyond us. This means we'd have to dig our bunkers deeper. We wouldn't have an atmosphere anymore to trap any form of heat or anything. We would be floating for an eternity. But let's go back to that scenario where the sun just decided to go dark. Don't worry, our planet would still be orbiting the sun along with the other planets. The temperatures would keep plummeting until nothing could survive on the surface. It would be total darkness 24-7. Only bacteria, and possibly tardigrades, could survive on the surface. Tardigrades are microscopic critters that can survive just about anything, including outer space. Eventually, oxygen would be absent from the Earth's surface, and there wouldn't be anything up there anymore, except for them. Since they would be the dominant and possibly the only creatures on the surface, they'd manage to evolve into bigger species and produce many more. Hundreds of thousands of years into the future, Humans would have had to evolve to the conditions underground. Our eyes would be much bigger to take up as much light as possible. Our skin would become whiter since there would be no sun underground. Our hearing would also be much more sensitive since the underground would create echoing sounds. We'd still have the intellect we do now, but our bodies would be ready for the surface. The main threat would be the giant tardigrades sluggishly dragging themselves around. Under a microscope, they look kind of cute, but imagine them the size of a polar bear. Still want something like this in your backyard? They can live anywhere, so they'd infiltrate the bunkers now and then. They'd get ferocious and come in different sizes and shapes. At this point, humans would not be the dominant species since they'd have to hide underground. Some tardigrades from different tribes wouldn't be friendly with each other. Major cities that used to be bustling with people would be home to giant water bears. Tardigrades are known as water bears since they kind of look like little bears. But these beasts with eight legs would be much bigger than them. Bears and most animals would have been wiped out on the surface. Under the ice, some deep sea creatures would thrive and have moved closer to the surface. These animals were used to living in darkness away from the sun. But over thousands of years of dominating the waters, they'd have grown to enormous sizes. Some of these creatures would adapt to crawling out of the mainland. Even though the surface would be frozen, they'd still find ways to crack through the ice and make their way. Humans, meanwhile, would create large underground channels and networks, building cities and colonies. We'd dominate the tunnels where our hands and feet would grow to become web-like and large. We'd take over everything underground and remain the smartest species on Earth. We'd manage to keep old art pieces from the surface and important records to stay as human as possible. We'd keep on surviving no matter what. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Now, did you know that our sun is actually green? Okay, okay, I'm kidding. But in reality, it's all colors you can imagine at the same time. Wait, what? I know it sounds like a joke, but I'm being serious, can't you tell? In fact, our sun contains absolutely all the waves of the light spectrum. It's simultaneously red, blue, green, yellow, you name it. Where do you think rainbows come from? When sunlight gets reflected off water droplets in the air, it splits into a bunch of colored waves that we can see individually. And when they're all together, we see a white ray of light. Our eyes are unable to perceive the concept of all colors at the same time, so their combination seems white to us. Wait, you might say, why white? Isn't the sun yellow? Yep, it's yellow too, but please don't stare at the sun just to make sure. It appears white when we see it from the International Space Station. This is the sun's real color as our eyes perceive it. The sun gets a yellowish hue when its rays get scattered in Earth's atmosphere. Our atmosphere doesn't let the blue rays of the spectrum pass very well, but the red ones? Hey, sure, why not? By the way, that's why the sky seems blue to us. The atmosphere scatters the blue color all over the place. During sunrise and sunset, short blue waves get reflected, but the long red ones reach us perfectly. That's why we see sunsets as pink, orange, or red. But what would happen if the sun had a different color? To answer this question, let's quickly repeat what we've learned. 1. The sun has the whole color spectrum in it. 2. Our atmosphere is like blue rays? No. Nope. Red rays? Anytime. 
So you probably already guessed what would happen if the sun was, let's say, red. The whole world would look like it does during sunsets. Not bad, huh? We wouldn't even have to wait for the evening to admire the scarlet sky. Orange water and a bright red moon. Yeah, it would be darker than what we're used to, but still not bad. Oh, by the way, one day, the sun will actually turn red. When its life comes to an end, it will expand and gradually turn into a red giant before finally burning out. But uh, it's not going to be so much fun for us. So let's hope we won't be around to see that moment. I know I won't. Hey, I've got a party to go to. Okay, now, what if the sun was green? Well, the truth is, the sun is green. So here's your dialogue. Wait, are you kidding me? Didn't you just say that it's white? Ooh, good job on that, by the way. Well, not exactly, bud. The sun just looks white, but technically, it has a temperature of around 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And the pink wavelength of the sun's spectrum corresponds to the green-blue hue. But to make sure that the sun is green, we need to drown out the rest of the visible spectrum. Then our atmosphere will let through a pure green color. And what'll happen then? Well, everything will be green. And everything will also be a bit darker. Well, face it, it's not easy being green. Okay, moving on. Now let's paint the sun blue. Blue stars actually do exist. They're called blue giants. Fortunately, our sun is not one of them. Why fortunately? Well, because if it was a blue giant, it would be a young, beautiful, unimaginably large, and very, very hot star. See, our red is hot, blue is cold logic doesn't apply to stars. The hottest stars are white and blue, and the coldest are yellow and red. Yeah, our sun is actually very cold compared to other stars. Now, take the average temperature in your city, but multiply it like by hundreds of thousands. Yeah, we're struggling with global warming here, but global burning? Eh, no thanks, blue giants. Anyway, let's imagine that the sun turned blue. How would we see the world? Surprisingly, nothing would change. Remember how I said that the atmosphere scatters blue light? That's why, in this case, everything would remain almost the same. Maybe the sky would get bluer, but we wouldn't see much difference. And finally, the darkest, pun intended, option. What if our sun turned black? Stock up on lamps and candles because there is no more light. People use electricity all over the world 24-7. We also can't see the moon anymore. After all, we can observe it these days only because the sun's rays get reflected off of it. Now, the only thing we still have to illuminate our nights are stars, but they don't help us much. Good thing this scenario is totally unrealistic and there are no black stars, right? Well, yeah, there are no black stars. And still, our sun will eventually become completely black one day. And I don't mean a black hole. I'm talking about black dwarfs here. You've probably heard of white dwarfs. Maybe even seven dwarfs. When a star like our sun is about to finish its life, it expands and turns into a red giant. And then, gradually losing its upper layers, it turns into white dwarfs. Since they no longer produce fuel, they slowly cool down. All that remains is a small core, living out its life and burning bright. And when the star cools down completely, right, it turns into a black dwarf. But you've probably never heard of them. Why? Because, surprise, surprise, they don't exist. And no, I was not lying. The thing is, a star needs about one quadrillion years to turn into a black dwarf. And our universe is still a baby. It's only about 14 billion years old. So no star has reached this stage yet. Even the most ancient of them still emit a little light. That's why black stars are just a theory. And it's unlikely that we'll ever see such a star at all. But remember the famous saying, the stars that we see at night are already ghosts because their light has reached us only now. Well, that's a myth. They're all still alive. Why am I telling you all this? Well, let's imagine that our sun turned into a black dwarf. The entire solar system would immediately get plunged into absolute darkness. It would also be terribly cold. The moon would leave its orbit and crash into Earth. Wait, no. Let's overlook this moment and assume we're still alive. Fortunately, we wouldn't freeze instantly, as you might think. Earth's core has its own temperature, more than 9,000 degrees. But the temperatures on the surface of the planet would still immediately drop to 32 degrees Fahrenheit. The core would gradually cool down. Every two months, its temperature would drop by two times. In just two months, 
Earth's surface temperature would be minus 190 degrees, and in a year, it would reach minus 450 degrees. Most plants would disappear pretty quickly, not because of the cold, but because of the lack of photosynthesis. Others would live a little longer thanks to the oxygen still remaining in the atmosphere. And, oddly enough, trees would survive for a very long time. They have a slow metabolism and get sugar from the ground. The upper layer of the oceans would freeze very quickly. Fortunately, this thick crust of ice would insulate deep waters, so the entire ocean wouldn't freeze for some time. Marine creatures would be doing pretty well. They existed long before us and are already used to crazy temperature changes, the lack of oxygen and food, huge pressures, and other joys of deep-sea life. And what about us humans? Well, first of all, we'd start getting sick. Without vitamin D, people would face a huge number of different health problems. Also, our bodies need sunlight to produce melatonin. This melatonin helps us understand when we should go to bed and wake up. If people didn't have this hormone, their bodies would get very confused and wouldn't understand whether they needed to sleep or not. That would mean insomnia for many people. But we would still be able to survive. We'd have two options – to build giant submarines and go down into the depths of the ocean closer to Earth's core, or stay on the surface, living our lives in some location where we'd have sources of geothermal energy – in Iceland, for example. We could also settle near volcanoes. Their heat would be enough to warm us for a long time. Our vision would adapt to the dark, but at some point, it would reach its maximum. So we'd need to get used to living in complete darkness. But who knows? Maybe we would adapt to this life, too. So, which option would you prefer? Living at the bottom of the ocean in a submarine or on the surface near volcanoes? You may think the Earth is pretty big, but the Sun makes up almost 99.9% .9 of the mass of the whole solar system. The rest of the mass is made up by the planets and their satellites, asteroids, comets, gas, and dust. It's around 93 million miles away from our planet, but it keeps us warm every day. Its temperature is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, but the space surrounding it is still cold as ice. To understand this, we need to distinguish between heat and temperature. Heat is the energy inside some object. Temperature is something that tells us if that object is hot or cold. When the heat is transferred to that object, it makes its temperature go up. When the object is losing heat, the temperature goes down. Heat can be transferred in three different ways. The sun does it through radiation. That means it's releasing heat in the form of light. Your body radiates heat too, as infrared waves. That's why thermal imaging cameras will detect that you're in the room even at night. The hotter the object, the more heat it will radiate. The temperature only affects matter. Since space is mostly a vacuum, it doesn't have enough particles for heat to transfer in any other way than through radiation. When the heat from the sun gets to an object, the atoms start absorbing energy. But the heat can't transfer, since there is no matter in space. Those rare atoms and molecules in space will absorb the heat. And they'll simply stay that way, while the cold vacuum will stay cold. There's a lot of matter inside Earth's atmosphere, so the energy of the sun can transfer easily. But if you put an object outside of the Earth's atmosphere in direct sunlight, it would end up heated to 250 degrees Fahrenheit because it's matter made of atoms and molecules. The temperature of the vacuum is negative 454 degrees Fahrenheit. That means, depending on where you are, space can either burn or freeze you. The sun isn't actually yellow. It emits light over a wide range of wavelengths. We can tell both its temperature and color by the peak in its spectrum. For instance, cooler stars will appear red, and hotter stars will be blue with yellow, orange, and white stars in between. When it comes to the sun, the spectrum peaks at a wavelength we'd usually call green, but our eye perceives it differently. So, the shade of green in combination with other wavelengths from the spectrum is going to look white to the human eye. We generally see the sun as yellow because our atmosphere scatters blue light more efficiently than the red one. During sunrise and sunset, there's more red light in the spectrum of the sun, which gives us amazing sceneries. Sunspots are part of the sun's visible surface that are on average way cooler than the sun itself. 
They overlap with parts that have an increased magnetic field. These parts don't allow the release of heat to the sun's visible surface. That way, the rest of the sun's surface is three times brighter than those sunspots. That contrast <laughs> makes them appear almost black. If we could take a sunspot apart from the sun and place it somewhere in the night sky, it would be different, as bright as the moon when we see it from the Earth. All the planets in our solar system spin in the same direction because they were formed from one protoplanetary cloud, except for Uranus and Venus. They have probably had some strong impact on them that made them spin in the opposite direction. But it's different with galaxies. They don't usually form the same cloud of dust and particles. Also, they're not randomly distributed across space. They come in filaments, dense, slender strands of dark matter and galaxies, with voids in between. Proto-galaxies are linked by gravitational forces in small areas of space. This is probably because of the distribution of dark matter throughout the universe. The matter in the filaments moves in a corkscrew motion and goes towards the densest area. So, there might be a common direction galaxies tend to spin, but it's mostly random. There's a possibility we'll see a lunar elevator one day. Yep, a cable anchored to the surface of the moon. It would stretch 250,000 miles. We wouldn't be able to directly attach it to our planet because both Earth and the Moon are moving. But we could keep it terminated high in our planet's orbit. Some researchers believe we could build such an elevator for a few billion dollars. The Moon has resources we could definitely use. A rare form of helium found there could be of use in fusion power stations on our planet. Also, we could take some other rare elements and use them in smartphones and the rest of electronics. So, after around 53 trips up and down, the elevator could pay for itself. The cable would be as thick as a pencil, but its weight would be around 40 tons. It could even be made of materials we already have here on Earth with no need to invent something. There could even be a combination of two elevators. A spacecraft would winch up an elevator from the surface of our planet to a space station. Then it would be flung towards the moon. There would be another elevator to finally lower it down to the surface of the moon. Planets in our solar system have predictable and stable orbits. But gas giant collisions could have happened at an early stage when a planetary system was still forming. In case of a head-on collision, two gas giants would merge they wouldn't end up losing their mass, the materials in their gaseous envelopes, or the ones in their solid cores. Such a collision at a higher speed would cause the loss of the major part of the envelope gas, and very high speeds, boom, both planets are gone. It's different if it's not a head-on collision. If two cores manage to completely avoid each other, gas giants won't merge, but they'll lose some of the mass gas giants might even change their shape due to such collisions. Astronomers found out there's a galaxy extremely far away from us that looks similar to our Milky Way. We now see it as it was when the universe was only 1.4 billion years old, and now it's 13.8 billion years old. It took over 12 billion years for the light to come from this faraway galaxy and reach our planet. This galaxy is peaceful, stable, and surprisingly non-chaotic, unlike all other galaxies that were quite turbulent in their early stages. To leave the Milky Way, we'd have to travel around 25,000 light-years away from the center of the galaxy, or 500 light-years vertically. Our galaxy is a disk of stars that spreads around 100,000 light-years across and is 1,000 light-years thick. The Sun, its central star, is located halfway from the center of the galaxy and close to the middle of the disk in the vertical direction. We'd have to go further than its edge to get away from the halo that surrounds the Milky Way, old stars, diffuse gas, and globular clusters. If you wanted to go even further to see the Milky Way in all its glory, you'd have to travel 48,000 light years vertically. At this moment, we don't even have a telescope we can send there. There are central stars that eat planets. Our solar system is stable, unlike many other planetary systems. So we don't have to be afraid the Earth or some other planet will change its orbit and go towards the Sun. 
But at least a quarter of other planetary systems with orbiting stars similar to the Sun have a pretty chaotic past. In some of them, there are planets that used to move around, and their unpredictable migrations have disrupted the paths of some other planets, or even pushed them outside of their orbit. That means some planets probably have fallen into the central star. When that happens, the planet gets dissolved in the outer layer of the star, which means it gets eaten.